What's up, everybody? This is Tyler Harris, and I am your host of the Breadwinner Podcast. Super excited today uh, to have Caleb Campbell with us. He's going to jump on here in just a second, but man, he's a motivational speaker, writer, entrepreneur. One of the coolest things that I read about you, man, is the very first, I think, sentence of your bio said that you believe in the transformation of the human soul, uh, which is absolutely awesome. But this guy is a former NFL, former West Point grad, uh, former military, which I have the utmost respect uh, for. So I'm super excited to have you on and kind of talk about uh, what your main focus is now. But if you could just introduce yourself, man, tell everybody where you're from. And uh, I'd love to just hear your story. And then we can kind of go from there, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. Um, like you said, my name's Caleb. I'm originally from a small Texas town in the very top of the Texas Panhandle, uh, what you know as Tornado Alley. <laughs> I grew up on a farm, actually, on a farm where I used to walk pigs uh, for 4-H shows, which is just still strange to me. <laughs> but, you know, I went from Perryton, Texas, a town of like 9,000 people, got a Division One scholarship to play football at West Point. And, you know, it was at West Point when I knew, like, yeah, sure, as a, as a kid, I had a childhood dream of playing in the NFL, but let's get real. But uh, my sophomore year, I turned out to be like, I had a breakout season and it turned out I was uh, like number six strong safety in the entire country for college football. Wow. A lot of scouts started coming around, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of NFL agents started coming around. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this could actually become a reality. Well, when you go to West Point, your sophomore year, after your sophomore year, going into your junior year, you basically take the oath. And that's essentially saying, hey, I'm in this for the long term. Yeah. Um, so when you graduate West Point, you're commissioned as an officer and you have a five-year minimal commitment in the U.S. military as an officer. Well, my sophomore year, I was kind of like, listen, you know, I was in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I was always getting in trouble at West Point. And I basically said, my childhood dream is to play in the NFL. Like, I'm out. Like, I'm in tons of trouble. It's not a good, not, not a good fit for me. I was breaking under the pressure. Um, well, that's when the Department of Defense, long story short, comes in and they say, hey, like, if you want to play in the NFL, we just adopt this new policy that will give you the opportunity to serve simultaneously while playing a professional sport if you have a professional contract. Hmm. So I go into my junior year, take the oath with the understanding that there's a new policy. It's called the Alternative Service Obligation Policy. And essentially, if I get drafted, then um, I could play and serve simultaneously. Long story short, fast forward two years, I graduated West Point. I was selected in the in the folks draft. Childhood dream comes true. I'm in Radio City Music Hall. I'm, I'm hanging out with at the time, you know, Rachel Nichols. Uh, it's just a childhood dream come true. I get drafted, and then day of my contract signing, uh, the Department of Defense calls and says, "Hey, that policy that we put into effect two years ago it no longer exists." Hmm. Um, so they essentially rescinded that policy. They ripped it up, and then I had to return back to active duty. So I went back to active duty. Everything was great. I started bobsledding for the U.S. Olympic team. Nice. Um, and I did that for three years. And then I had applied for an early release. And so I went from playing or from serving. I got an early release. I got back and I played for uh, Detroit, Kansas City, and Indianapolis. You know, bounced around practice squad, active roster, practice squad, active roster. But I guess the real story is, is kind of like I knew that while I was in the NFL, I, like I was self-destructing. Yeah. Like here I am in the middle of my childhood dream and I'm, I'm literally showing up to practice high from the night before yeah. and I'm just self-destructing. Um, you know, I woke up one morning, I said, Oh my God, like if something doesn't change and change soon with me, it's, it's, I'm done. Yeah. Like life is not going to continue for me. And so that's when I decided to stop everything. Um, I got cut for the last time. And then I said, okay, like I went to West Point and there was tons of people offering me amazing job opportunities. But I realized that unless something internally changed inside of me, I was going to continue to hit that same ceiling despite what environment I was in. Because I wanted to demonize football. I wanted to say football was the issue, football's bad, football's this, football's that. And I think we have the tendency to do that, right? We like to yeah. demonize the things and the people that are closest to us because of how it's making us feel. But the fact of the matter is football wasn't the issue. It was revealing the issue inside of me. And so I stopped everything, man. And I went from playing <laughs> in front of 90,000 people in the NFL to moving to Canada. And for four years, I slept in a boiler room on the basement floor of a pastor's house 
so that I could be mentored. Um, and for four years, I literally swept floors and cleaned toilets wow. and got mentored by this man. And it revolutionized my life. It completely changed the trajectory of my life. And that's essentially like the story that I talk about, the story yeah. behind the story. Um, and then from that, I just, I just recently birthed Why I Stop. I think you guys seen that. Yep. Um, it's the blog. It's a platform for people to tell their own Why I Stop stories. Uh, but that's kind of like where I'm at right now. It's my brand message. It's what I believe in. And that's where I get I believe in the transformation of the human soul. Yep. Like one day we can, wake up, we can wake up and we can realize that we don't have to experience life in the way that we've been told to. Mm. Man, so, so let's go back to that, that unbelievable transition to Canada. Um, <laughs> who, who was this? Uh, was it, it was, you said it was a pastor? Yeah. Who was the pastor and how did you find him? Is that someone that you had been following for a while or was it just something completely random? You're not going to believe this, man. I was in between teams uh, getting ready to, uh, it was right before I signed with Kansas City, which was the last time I played for. I was uh, in limbo. I was in my aunt's basement in Denver, Colorado, and I was drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm scrolling through Twitter, man. And I come across, I come across this girl that I don't know, and she's talking about this transformation in her life. And it's the first time that I read somebody's message that, put words to what I was feeling that I couldn't actually put feeling to or make sense of. Yeah, absolutely. And so I started following her and I'm like, what is she doing? And long story short, she's going back to her hometown, Buffalo, New York, where she's going to start serving in this church. And I'm like, what church? Like she has this amazing life. She's an attorney. She's a, Oh, like she's doing amazing things. Um, and like, she's leaving it all. So I started getting into this church and I literally didn't tell anybody flew to Canada. I found this church. I sat in a service and I'm sitting there. Don't know anybody. I'm there by myself for a day on a Sunday just to, just to listen to service because something within me was telling me to go. And then I was like, Oh my God, this is where I'm supposed to be. Hmm. And it wasn't like a divine sign. It was just this little, very, very small flicker of intuition I yeah. said, this is where I'm supposed to be. I still went to Kansas City, signed from Kansas City. I went home for a little bit, kicked and screamed because I didn't want to make the transition. Yeah. Uh, but eventually that's where I moved. That's how I found it, Twitter. That's incredible, man. <laughs> it's funny when those things happen, and you could have just as easy have brushed that off, especially when you said it was subtle. Like you could just have easy have, have, have left there and, and not ever thought about it again, but making that decision to go and, and, and not go do something glamorous and not to go do something fun, go humble yourself right. uh, and, and be able to have that experience that ultimately brought you here, um, which is awesome, man. I have a similar story that you'll uh, enjoy. Um, this was, oh, let's see, a couple of years ago. I had gone through this crazy transformation in my life over the last four years from being broke and depressed and out of shape and basically just rock bottom for me. And it was about a year and a half to two years into this transformation, things were going incredible. Uh, but I started having this feeling of just like, you know, what am I really supposed to be doing? What's my purpose in life? You know, what, what was I put on this earth to do? And one Friday, I was uh, leaving my office. I was driving up to Asheville, North Carolina. My wife uh, was up there. It's where her family is. She had gone up earlier that day, and we we're going to grill out with her family that night. And so I'm headed up there. And when you go up there to Asheville, North Carolina, you go through the mountains at, at some point. And I always lose service on my phone at this one spot uh, when I'm driving. And I just had a, a really rough day. And I'm in the car, and I just start praying. And not just – not that – kind of like super cool, happy prey, like the ugly crying prey. And I, I just told God, I was like, God, I need you to tell me right now, right now, what am I supposed to be doing? Right now, show me, tell me right now, what am I supposed to be doing? And I've been texting with my wife and uh, I said something like, you know, hey, headed up there now. Uh, you want me to grab some beer on the way? And she said our daughter had just been like a nightmare that day. And I said, um, or should I get beer and tequila? <laughs> and that's when kind of like I lost service up in the mountains. And so I'm sitting there in this intense prayer, God, show me right now, what am I supposed to be doing? 
and I had just come up on the other side of the mountain and got service again. And my phone vibrates in my lap the second that I said, show me right now. And I pick up my phone and I look at it. And as my wife responding in a very strange phrase that she hadn't used in this context for a long time, no one has in a long time, but it said, preach. That's all it said. So my like, God, show me what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Phone vibrates, look at it, it says, preach. <laughs> and the crazy thing was I looked at that and I'm like, uh, come again. <laughs> and we were in the process of starting a church. Um, are you familiar with Elevation Church? Yeah. Pastor yeah. Stephen Furtick. So we started a, um, a Greenville extension site of Elevation. We were in the process of doing that at that time. So like that idea, like wasn't completely far-fetched, but for me, it was completely far-fetched. Sure. Um, but the interesting thing that I found over the course of the next year is that it didn't say be a preacher it said preach and you can preach from any platform and social media is certainly one of those. And it's just about putting a message out there that can reach hundreds, thousands, millions of people um, from this incredible platform that we all have access to. And so for me, that was one of those cool trans just transitional periods of my life of kind of regaining focus on what I'm really here to do, um, which has been absolutely awesome. Uh, so, Let's go back. I do want to talk about real quick about the why I stopped because I was scrolling through the website. Uh, the website, by the way, just aesthetically is freaking awesome. Like it's beautiful. Oh, that means so much, man. It's a really good site. Like I like how when you scroll and what happens with the, uh, the videos when you do that. So where did that idea come from? And is that a big focus of what you're doing now? Or is that just something that's kind of on the side? Kind of what's, what's the focus there? Um, yeah, I was... Uh actually in the middle, like the second set of a deadlift <laughs> and I'm in the middle of the reps and I, I, it's, it's, it's annoying because I do my best thinking in the gym, but it yeah. really throws my focus and yeah. I don't get crap workout. And I always get crap <laughs> workout now. Uh, but I was literally just deadlifting and I was like, Oh my God, like why I stopped. And for the longest time I've, I've been wanting to articulate this process. Um, yeah. I wanted to put words to it. I wanted to bring it to fruition in some capacity, in some creative way. And I didn't want it just to be about me, but I knew that like when I had mentioned, like I read somebody else's story and their story put words to what I was feeling. Yep. And that was so important to me. And that has happened time and time and time again, because we don't know what we don't know. Sure. Right? And that's the beautiful thing of prophecy, right? When we look at other people's lives and the prophetic image of what we're about to step into, mm -hmm. it gives us an understanding of what we're stepping into. And so I've been wanting to create a platform that allows other people to tell their story and their own why I stop stories so that people can come along and say, A, I'm not alone, but B, oh my gosh, you just put words to what I've been feeling my entire life. Yeah. And then on the flip side of it, it's something that there is so powerful whenever you as the creator and telling your story and realizing that your truth makes a difference. Heck yeah. Right, your truth makes a huge impact on other people's lives. And you start to realize that my healing, my transformation just wasn't for me, but it's literally opening up doors for other people. Yep. And it has a ripple effect on other people. And that you know makes profound impact. So that's how I kind of came up with why I stopped. And truthfully, it's been, um, I, I started in Buffalo. I started a marketing and design digital marketing agency with a friend. We scaled two of us to nine of us or eight of us. And we're about to take off. And just in end of January, I was like, this isn't my, path. like, this isn't what I want to do. And if I don't get yeah. out now, yep. um, you know, stuck. it's going to take off and I'm going to stay here. Yeah. And so I just left recently and kind of going all in on my brand, yeah. um, trying to make sense of it. I have no idea what I'm doing, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so why I stopped is just recently, uh, basically last week I said, this is my main focus. This okay. is the story that I want to tell. This is the community I want to build. Awesome. Well, if there's an opportunity available, man, I'd love to get on there and tell my story because um, I've got a really interesting story um, as well. And it's funny, man, like 18 months ago, two, 18 months ago to two years ago, you know, I'm sitting on, I'm sitting, I'm standing on stage talking to a group of insurance agents and, and I asked them and I love asking this question. I said, you know, what's the one area in your life that you're pretending isn't a problem? Mm -hmm. What's the one area in your life that you're pretending isn't a problem? And then it's always like, you know, okay, just a little hint that thought that just came to your mind. That's it. So, <laughs> so let's freaking, let's figure that out. 
and, sure. and then we can work on all this other stuff. But until you figure that out, there's really no point in, in trying to grow uh, any further. Um, but the crazy thing is it was two years ago, 18 months ago that I said that. And like the second I said it in my brain said alcohol, 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 but let's just say, bah, you know, no big deal. It's you just kind of brush it off, forget about it. And it wasn't until seven months ago, I completely quit drinking. So I haven't drank in seven months now. It's been the most incredible, incredible period of time in my life. Um, but when you talked about feeling alone or feeling by themselves, like that's exactly like when I looked at the why I stopped, like when you're going through a difficult time or a struggle, you feel like you're on an island. Like you feel like no one's ever gone through this ever before. But then you go to a site like this and you see all these stories and you're like, wait a second, like their story's worse or their story's similar or their story. Um, it, it resonates with me. And then through other people telling their stories, it gives them the audacity to go and tell theirs to someone because that's usually the first step. And the most important step is just to talk to someone about it. I think it's more important than ever for us as men to be able to do that because men historically do not have the um, ability, but do not have the outlet to have these types of conversations with other men. Right. Uh, and I think that's, it's, that's become a huge passion of mine um, is, is trying to create that environment. And so with all my social media stuff, transparency, vulnerability, like that's the main core focus and in sharing things like, like when I shared, I have this daily vlog that I've been doing since January, we've got like 117 episodes, something like that. But on episode 100, uh, we're like, hey, how are we going to celebrate you know, the 100th episode? It's kind of a big milestone kind of deal. And on the 100th episode, I literally walked into a room, sat down. It was the exact same scene from the very first episode. But I walked in the room, sat down and said, well, over these last 100 episodes, we've had you know incredible things that have happened, stories, all this stuff. And I've been lying to you the entire time because this entire time I've been struggling with the fact that I quit drinking like 30 days before. I started this vlog and I've never even talked about that to you. And so I started opening up about that. Like the messages that poured in that next day, like yeah. one guy said, um, I've been struggling with alcoholism for 17 years and talked to my wife about it last night for the first time after seeing yeah. that video and things, things like that. And then I've opened up with some other stuff here recently that were very difficult um, to open up with. But like every time you do, it's, it's this idea of just living in truth. Yeah. And, and withholding the truth and lying is the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, so if you, it's, you know, it, it's easy to say like, oh yeah, I'm all about living the truth when it's comfortable <laughs> or I'm all about living the truth when it makes me look good. Right. But when you put everything out there, it's almost like the, you know, that, that rap battle scene in eight mile where you're like basically telling everything bad about you. Um, yeah. And so that no one's got anything on you because you've already told it. And, and it's expressing gratitude for those things, right? Like, like I'm so freaking grateful um, for the struggles that I've had, the things that have happened to me, the things that I've done and being on the other side of that now, because it's made me who I am. Right. Um, and I think that that's for me becoming a huge focus is number one, like you're doing, you know, showing people these stories of other people that they can resonate with. so They don't feel alone. But then number two, showing them that like when you're in it, like, hey, there, there is a huge freaking blessing right on the other side of this, but you have to get through what you're doing to become the person that can receive it. Yeah. And that there's purpose and there's, there's, there's so much uh, encouragement in that because you will be incredibly grateful for what you're going through right now. What I can't figure out yet is like how to really convey that because the person that's in it, like, they're like, screw you, you know, like, like you don't, you don't understand. You don't get it. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I understand what you're saying. It's all going to be good in the end, but it's not taking the gun out of my mouth tonight. Okay. Uh, so how you convey that message, because it is always in hindsight that they understand it. Um, so what are some of your thoughts on that? Like, cause now this is, I guess your main focus is conveying that message to people because you want to reach people that are, that are in it. Yeah. 100%. Um, you know, I think if you look at why I stopped and you look at all the stories, there is like almost 
across every single story, the common denominator that is found in every story is there is an element of shame. Yeah. Um, that people have to work through. And you, you hit the nail on the head, like shame thrives in secrecy, hmm. right? And shame just, when you don't deal with shame, it just perpetuates the cycle over and over again. And so shame thrives in secrecy. So the first step is recognizing that you're not alone in all of this and that somebody else is going through um, a process that, or in a, in a situation that you've gone through or maybe similar to what you're going through. But I think a critical component of this, Tyler, you hit the nail on the head is, I think we as human beings, uh, we have to, we have to be able to hold space better for people. We have to be able to create an ecosystem, an environment where you can come to me and you can open up and, and, and I don't respond with, well, well, get your shit together, Tyler. Yeah. Or I don't respond with, well, you know, I know somebody else that has it worse. Mm-hmm. Or I don't respond with just an answer that just reinforces the shame of what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling it, right? Yep. And the only way we can get better at holding space because it's in that very sacred space that you know connection is made and the only way we can get better at holding space is by first creating space hmm. people don't know how to hold space or don't have the capacity to hold space because they haven't yet created space and what I mean by creating space is I mean dealing with your own pain yeah dealing with your own wounding Quit offsetting your emotion. Quit inflicting your pain onto other people. Create space. Stop and ask why you feel what you feel and why you think what you think. And maybe along the lines, question why you believe what you believe. And ask yourself, have you ever actually been lied to before? Right? And so whenever you begin to create space, we can now begin to hold space more efficiently and effectively for other people going through that same process. And I think that is such a missing component because, you know, it's the first thing we think of, like, I got my own issues. Don't bring your issues to me. Yeah, sure. I got my own issues. Yeah, that's true. But you also have to take responsibility for your own issues, work through that so that you can be able to, human connection is what we were made for, Tyler. Yeah, absolutely. Human connection is what we were made for. And when you hold space for another human or for another soul, that connection is the bridge to meaningful relationships, which is actually the, the, the fulfillment that we're looking for. Hmm. Physiologically speaking, all the neuroscience that's coming out right now centered around this topic, it speaks volumes to it. So I think that's where I'm really kind of focusing on is I don't look at why I stopped just as a platform for people to share their stories, but why I stopped is this ecosystem that in and of itself is designed to hold space. Yeah. And that's what I'm looking for. It's almost like creating capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the reality is like our brains only have so much capacity and we're giving away so much of it to this drama over here, this lie we keep believing over here, this opinion that we think someone has of us over here, this shame, like you said, that we have over here. And all of a sudden we're working with 40, 50% capacity. Right. We don't have the ability to not only create space, but hold space for anybody else because you hardly have enough space for yourself. Um, and I think, man, it's so important, especially as men, because you said that connectivity is everything. But I think somewhere along the line, um, men decided that that was not the case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's and it's unfortunate, but I think that there's a strong movement right now. Um, people like uh, yourself and uh, and you remind me a whole lot of Lewis Howes and, and some of the, the stuff that he mm-hmm. um, talks about with the mask and masculinity um, that I think it needs to be furthered so much more because the reality is as a man, you, you, you know, you're walking down the hall, you're driving down the road. Hey man, how you doing? Great, great. Hey man, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. No complaints. But meanwhile, they're cheating on their wife. Their kids hate them. Their business is struggling and they're barely, barely staying above water. Uh, but this idea, like, like you just said, of, of holding space is creating an environment to where people can be honest and be vulnerable, uh, which is very, very, very um, difficult for, for the majority because they've been lied to their entire lives and they've been told that that's not okay. Like it's not okay to, to talk about what's really going on. You got to put up this front and social media has, has done an incredible job at showing people that like, Hey, it's all about the highlight reel. It's all about showing the best parts of your life and completely keeping those 
those hidden areas hidden. Um, so I think, man, you're on to such an incredible, um, incredible start to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's more important than people realize. It's more yeah, I think, uh, you know, to be honest with you, like whenever I was going through this change, like I wanted to know why, why was I addicted to pornography? Yeah. Why was I so, why, was, why did I have to bring home a girl every night I went out to the bar? And not just bring out a girl, but bring home a girl, but use her. Yep. I had no intention of doing anything beyond just sex with her. Why did, I, why did that make me feel more powerful? Yeah. Why did that make me feel more in control? Like these were things that were literally destroying my life and would make me physically sick to my stomach. And if I didn't numb that pain and I, and I, I couldn't sit with that pain, it hurt too much. Yeah. Like there were, there were just questions I did not want to ask, but I knew if my, if the cycle of life that I was still in didn't change, I was going to continue to destroy people's lives while destroying my life. I say that because what has to change is as men, we want to live brave lives. We want to live courageous lives. Mm -hmm. It's, it's we're hunters and gatherers. It's yeah. what we were created to do. Like we were created to lead. But when we were a young kid and we were told to suck it up and quit crying, when we were a young kid and we were told that, you know, it's, it's, it's a sign of weakness when you show weakness or when you talk about your weakness, people are going to, you know, get over you and you need to suck it up and pull it up pull yourself up by your bootstraps and drive on son. Like right there, when we are almost, we don't understand, like even if the parent has good intention, we don't understand that in that moment, we were just shamed for expressing our vulnerabilities. Yep. And we learned to internalize our fear. And we, when we learn to internalize our fear, it's going to manifest. And it's gonna manifest in one of two ways, essentially based by your personality type. For somebody that's result oriented, uh, performance driven, now that usually manifests in um, perfectionism, rage. Yep. Rage is huge. Like I had such a rage issue, mm -hmm. and it took me hundreds of counseling sessions to attach my rage issues to being um, shamed for expressing vulnerability as a kid. Yeah. Right? And the same thing for pornography. I never knew pornography was me trying to control an environment so that I can find ultimate satisfaction at the expense of another person. Yeah. And that all started from being shamed as a young kid. Yeah. And so we have to do better at really articulating the message that, Hey, there's different ways to raise your children. I don't have kids. I can't even begin to imagine what that is like. Um, but at the end of the day, this idea that, Vulnerability is synonymous with weakness is the biggest lie. It is the biggest lie because vulnerability is the birthplace. I think Brene Brown says it. It's the birthplace of all of what we're actually desiring in life. And yep. so we need more men to step up and to talk, to deal with their pain, yep. to recognize that it's okay, that you are not your pain and it's not a sign of weakness to recognize that your control issues and your performance issues and your, and your rage issues and whether it's pornography or drinking or alcoholism or drug use, whatever it is, like recognize that those are all symptoms of a deeper issue. Yeah. And if you actually want your life to change, we got to get to the deeper issue. Yeah. And I like how you said on the, I think it's on your site on why I stopped that, that you have to go like way, way, way back yeah. Uh, and get a sense of understanding of all that's going on before you can even start to move forward, yeah. um, which is work. <laughs> I mean, like you just talked about hours and hours and hours of counseling. Um, that takes work and that's work that a lot of people aren't willing to put in. Uh, but when you, when you understand that vulnerability is strength, the funny thing about that is when you see people on stage being vulnerable, yeah. it's, it's, it's so easily, uh, a parent you're like oh yeah that the vulnerability that they just share man that that's that dude's so strong for sharing that but why is it that on an individual basis or when it comes back to me like why why do all of a sudden i feel as though vulnerability may be a sign of weakness when i'm seeing the guy on stage be vulnerable and i look at that as a as a strength mm -hmm. um it's interesting to get that down to the individual uh level but i mean vulnerability this there's a guy in in town here and he told me this concept that he called it puddle love, puddle love. And it's this idea that 
you can drown in three inches of water. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that's where all of social media lives. And quite frankly, that's where all of our conversations live. Uh, the vast majority of people's conversations on a daily basis live in that three inches of water. Um, and so I had made this conscious effort um, here in the last few months of just going deep in every single conversation. And it's almost humorous because a lot of times, yeah, I've got a videographer that, that travels with me. And a lot of times, I mean, we'll sit down with someone and it could be the first time I've met him, someone that I've known, but you know, the camera's rolling and it's just like, Hey man, what's going on? Oh, that's awesome. Cool. Sit down. And then all of a sudden it's just like deep. Like we, like all of a sudden we're digging out stuff that yeah. is just insanely deep. And it's some of the best conversations and some of the best connections that I've been able to create with people. And in doing so, the practice of doing that have become better at it. Mm -hmm. but have become a better person because of it, because I actually genuinely care now. Like normally it was just like, ah, oh, you're having a conversation and it's mainly small talk. I'm not really in it. But when you really try to connect with another human being, you can't help but care for that human being when you're connecting on that level. And when they're being vulnerable is when it takes that connection to the next level. Yeah. Uh, but it, a lot of times it's you being vulnerable first to give them the audacity to then share something uh, and then you share something else and then, and then they share something. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the cornerstone of, of great uh, communication uh, with other people. And again, like I could keep going back to this as men, it just is something that is not happening on a regular basis. Like I think about, um, you know, people like my dad, my, my friends, and especially an older gener you know, the, the prior generation, like they're not having these conversations with other people. Maybe, you know, if they're really connected with a church and they're in like a small group, uh, especially if it's a men's group, you know, they may have some of those conversations, but there's so much that they're just not willing to expose. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think that it's a problem because it's their willingness to expose those things that's going to teach our generation how to be a man. Like, what does it mean to be a man? Like you had this idea. I was on this podcast. I don't know if you've uh, heard of the order of man podcast with Ryan Mickler. I know him. Yeah. Yeah. So he, his whole thing is like, what does it, what does it mean to you to be a man? And, and this idea, like, what does it mean to be a man? And, and all these things that over, over the years and over time are synonymous with being a man. But what if being a man meant being vulnerable, meant being able to show your emotions and, and all those things like what kind of world would we live in if that was the case and it's just to me it's just become such a huge focus um, which I love I love the fact that that's really I mean that's what you're doing um, and it's awesome to see so what does it look like uh, moving forward uh, for you I know you said you're like ah you have no idea kind of what <laughs> what I'm doing right now which to, to be honest is like the best place to be um, everybody but, keeps saying that <laughs> It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like back to that uh, blessing on the other side of this. And you're like, yeah, screw you. Uh, but, but what is it that you want to do? Like when you think about, you know, man, like if I could do anything, uh, what, what, what would I, what would that look like for you? Um, I think it's, uh, I, I want to help change people's lives by changing what they believe by facilitating a conversation with them that helps them. And I'm not a shrink, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a guru, right? But I, I, I think you can't give away what you don't first possess, okay? I'm a yep. strong believer in that. So yep. for me, there is this continuous, I thought everybody wanted to ask tough questions. Like I have this weird desire to be vulnerable. Like for myself, I, I want to know why I think what I think and do why I do and get to the root of these issues. And I thought everybody was like that. Yeah. I'm like, Oh yeah, everybody likes that. Right. <laughs> Took me some time to realize that's just not the case. And so for me personally, it's kind of like, I want to continue getting to, um, you know, my, my, my deepest desire, Tyler, is to live a whole life yeah. physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I can't live a whole life whenever, W-H-O-L-E, whenever it's full of shame or guilt or trauma. And so there is this constant, like, we're never going to get rid of shame, but we will build a resilience to shame. And being able to help people 
have that same breakthrough in their lives. Like they don't understand, like you are literally one thought process away from your life forever changing. Yep. And we just need to focus this conversation and navigate this journey through like I, yeah, navigate this journey so that you can begin to ask them, ask the questions that are literally going to change your life when you're able to answer them. Like, you know, I think I just heard somebody talk about how like shame, I know I'm using shame a lot, but it's the swampland of the human soul. Hmm. And oftentimes we stand alongside the, alongside the shore of shame and we're wa- looking at this swamp huh. and we do not want to walk through that swamp, but we fail to recognize that along the shore of swampland is quicksand. <laughs> and we're literally standing in quicksand and we're ever so slightly sinking wow. a little bit more each and every day until we're in over our heads because we think that it's more traumatizing or more painful to walk through the shame, to walk through the swampland. And so being able to create an ecosystem or a conference yeah. or an environment, or I know a lot of people are doing this and it's not like, you know, I need to go do something on my own because I have to feel significant in this world. Like be able to partner with somebody um, that's doing these types of things because I think it's pivotal. I think it's important. And people need to realize that you can change. Yeah. Like you don't have to continue to experience life in the way that you were told or that the way you're currently experiencing it you're shaping your own reality so let's change the experiences uh that are currently shaping your reality man that's that to me is the most exciting part when you talk about you can change like when you when you do embrace this idea and and i'm very similar to you right now in this kind of quest to be as vulnerable as humanly possible um to the detriment, like it's made my, my family very uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's made people extremely uncomfortable in things that I'm sharing. They're like, ah, oh, I don't, I don't really know if you should have shared that. I'm like, no, but it's, it's the truth. So I'll have share. You got, have you got a, uh, yeah. Tone it down, Tyler. Tone it yeah. Down. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like you don't need to share everything. Like, yeah. cause wow. there was, there was something big recently that I shared and, and I told my wife and I hadn't told my wife about it. Um, when I told her about it, she's like, ah, you really don't need to be super public about that. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And, um, she's like, well, yeah, but what is this person going to say? What is this person going to say? I was like, I, that's not really of any consequence to me. Like it doesn't bother me. And I think it's a, it's an interesting concept of ego with vulnerability. Cause that's really what it comes down to. And, and what we've been talking about a lot is the fact that those that have the least ego, those that have dropped their ego the most yep. often appear to have the biggest ego. Right. Because they don't care what other people think. Yeah. Like, like I look at a guy like Sean Whalen that, that I mentioned in the beginning, like this guy, when he stands on stage and talks, you look at him and you're like, man, this guy's just egotistical. He's just full of himself. Yeah. It's like, no, like he's just free. Like yeah. he's completely free because he can stand there and say like, I don't care what any of you think, right. but I'll do anything for any of you. Right. And, and I that's, think, yeah. And that's the key. Yeah. I think uh, like a lot of people, have this disposition of, I don't care what you think, I'm gonna do my thing, great. But I think we have to get really real and say, is that disposition, while the the statement is true, like you shouldn't care what other people think, but is it rooted in love or is it rooted in fear? Or is it rooted in pain? And that's where I think a lot of people miss the boat is they live these lives where I don't care what you think, I'm gonna do me. Awesome. Do you, but you're doing you from a place of hurt. You're doing you from a place of pain. So you're going to go do you and the whole world's going to look at it, but you're not going to be fulfilled because you've got this wall around your heart and you're doing you in despite of other people instead of for other people. And so that's the big difference I find with people yeah. is like, you know, looking at the motives, what is the driving force behind why you do what you do? Mm. Is it rooted in love and selflessness and faith and hope, or is it rooted in fear and dread and selfishness and pain? Yeah. Because that makes the biggest difference in whether you are actually going to accomplish something and feel fulfilled versus accomplish something and it never being enough and needing to accomplish more and more and more. Right. Yeah, and absolutely. so I feel like that, that, that has to become a central, like, a central topic is like really examining the driving forces behind our lives. And that's, that's why I stopped. 
And the, and the reality is like, people are never going to quit caring what other people think. And I think that well, that idea is ridiculous, but it's not letting what other people think um, control your actions. Right. I think that's the big thing is, is, is understand that like, yeah, these people are going to say these things, but I'm still going to do these things anyways um, because I know it'll help them. And, and getting back to the exciting part is now, you know, when, when vulnerability becomes such a huge part of your life, and trying to have this connectivity with others, it's almost like when you're having a conversation with someone, they start being vulnerable and they start uncovering some of these things that they've been through or that have happened to them or things they've done. I start getting so excited. Like the worse it is, like the more excited I get. And like the other day I was talking to this guy at lunch and he just started just opening up and, and pouring out just horrific things uh, that have happened. And at the end of it, and I just kind of sat there and, and listened. And, and at the end, he's like, so, so what do you think, man? I was like, man, I got to tell you, I'm so freaking excited for you. And he was like, what? <laughs> what? What do you mean? I'm like, man, like I can tell, like I can look in your eyes and tell like you've made that transition. Like you've made that change in a positive way. And it's almost directly proportionate. Like the worst things got, the worst things were, is how far you're going to go if you make that change. And that's the, the biggest encouragement there is like those, those are the, the stories that everybody, you know, wants to hear. Like if you're able to make that change, sharing your story, it gives you that much bigger of a platform because it's like, Hey, if this guy, this guy that went through this, like if he can, can overcome that and if he can be happy and if he can uh, be winning in all these different areas of his life, uh, then certainly I can can go out and make a change in my life. And it just, again, it gives people this uh, sense of hope. Uh, and I think that ult ultimately that's what vulnerability does. It gives other people yeah. hope because they may not have been through the same thing. There may be way less, maybe way worse, uh, but you give people that glimmer of hope and you never know where it's going to come from. That's what I love about social media. Like I've shared things on vlog episodes or on podcasts and it's things that I didn't even see is that significant and then you get a message that comes in and, and you're like man you said this two nights ago on this vlog episode and it absolutely just crushed me and i've made this change and this change and this change and i'm like man at that moment on that episode i, I wasn't even thinking about that really impacting anyone uh, but i think it's this idea of just living in truth all the time um, mm. to where it, it enables those awesome magical moments to happen yeah you're just putting the truth out there and and those that will resonate those that are in a place where they're willing and able to receive that message and have it do something within them they're going to receive it uh no matter what and yeah. that's so important i think uh in, in addition to what you said if, if i can elaborate on something that i focus on in my life is i often hear something like live your truth or yeah. you know like, like, what does that look like? Yeah. Like, what does that look like to wake up today and to live your truth? Yeah. And I like, I had to break that down for myself and hopefully this is like practical enough to help somebody that might be listening to this. But to live your truth means to live from a place of truth. So to live from a place of truth means I don't live from a place of lie. Right. And so like I broke this down and I know there's a lot of science to this, but we have one or two things that we get to believe, right? So like from the ages of infancy to about 12 years old, our belief systems are formed, right? It's called the, first, the principle of first things. Whenever we experience something for the first time, that shapes our belief system, whether it's true or whether it's false, yeah. right? And so to live from truth means we live from a place of truth and not from a place of lies. So how do we know if we're actually believing a lie? Well, so for about two years, bro, I literally carry a, a, a notebook in my back pocket. And I, and I do it now today. I'm, you know, I'm better at it, so I don't have to do it with a notebook. But anytime I feel a negative emotion, hmm. if I feel fear, if I feel dread, or if I feel shame, if I feel like I'm hiding from something and I'm afraid of confronting something, if I feel anxiety or anger, whatever it is, I stop. Because you have to understand that like we were never physiologically, we were never created or wired to feel negative emotions. There's actually a, a chemical reaction happening in our brain that is creating um, you know, more chemicals in our brain knows what to do with. And as a result, we have these chemical imbalances that result yeah. in fear, and dread, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, 
And so what happens is, it's like every time you feel a negative emotion, stop. Like if you actually want your life to change, stop, because that negative emotion is actually rooted in a lie. So there's a lie that you've learned to believe in your life that's creating, because you're wired for truth. Truth is in your DNA. It's the essence of who we are. We are wired for love. Yep. So anything that comes alongside of your life and you feel a negative emotion to it, you then know there is something that you believe to be true about the world that isn't actually true. So mm -hmm. that negative emotion, instead of reacting it to it, learn to respond to it, learn to hold space to it, for it, learn how to not to judge it, but to look at it and say, okay, wait a minute, I'm feeling a negative emotion right now, therefore I know this negative emotion is just a symptom of a deeper belief system that is not true. And as long as I live governed by this belief system that's not true, I'm not living truth. I'm not living my truth. I'm being dictated by a lie, mm -hmm. right? And so this is where a lot of people, this is how you can make it practical. Yeah. There's a thing called the refractory period, right? So a refractory period is essentially when something happens and uh, you, know, you react to it and you react to it for minutes and your res the result of your reacting to, to it is last like minutes or hours, let's say. Like that's what we get a mood. I'm just in a mood, leave me alone. I'm just in yep. a mood, if something happened, right? Sure. But if that lasts longer, let's say not just minutes or hours, but let's say days and weeks, now we have a temperament. Now we can look at people and say, man, why is that guy so bitter, right? Because he's actually allowed his reaction to a negative emotion or to a situation, he's succumbed to it, and he's lasted for longer than hours or days, it's now weeks and months, and now it's becoming a temperament. If that continues to last longer, you don't get a hold of that. And if that continues to last longer for months and even years, that then begins to shape our personality. So if you understand that like literally pain, anger, or something that happens in your life and you react to it and you don't actually stop and question it and question the narrative that you're telling yourselves in regards to it, it literally shapes your personality and it is the very definition of living a lie. Wow. And so I find it like always helpful to say, okay, what does it actually look like to live truth and how do I go about that in my everyday process? First and foremost places, start with your negative emotions because yeah. they're like bright neon signs saying, hey, massive growth right here. Yeah. And then willing to go and do that journey. The interesting thing, before I get into that, are there any specific books that you've read that have helped wow. with that? Everybody asking me this question. I need to write yeah. up. Oh, about that? No. About I, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. no that was, it's, so, it's so interesting what you just said because a lot of what people learn, especially when it comes to like things like law of attraction, things like that, yeah. um, is to completely tone out that negativity, yeah. which is interesting. And, and when you talk about that that is a symptom of a deeper belief system that isn't true, so it's basically tracing, okay, I I'm feeling something negative. Something, I mean, something negative is happening. Let me trace that all the way back to, to where the root is and figure out why do I see that as a negative or why do I um, process it or internalize it in a negative way mm -hmm. and then try to figure that out. And that's interesting that that, that is because I never really thought about that because I have heard that a million times. Yeah, you know, live your truth and live in <laughs> truth, and it's like, what does that mean? Um, right. Just don't lie. Um, but but when you think about that, like it's it's actually it's it kind of breaks it down to a science uh, and a right. process. And I think that that is something that needs to be. I need to learn more uh, about that certainly because when you can break those things down, there's probably very very. Um, there's probably some core elements that many different negative things would fit into that you can be like, Oh, that's one of those. Oh, that's one of these. Oh, that's one of those. Mm -hmm. And it's not always kind of tracing back to this place where you have to all of a sudden do hours and hours of, of meditation and, and understanding and, and talking and figuring out it, like it fits into probably some categories of things that happen um, and, and ways of belief from those early childhood years. That's, that's really, really, really fascinating. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, like when you sat in that chair tonight, today, Tyler, did you stop and think like, wait, is this chair going to hold me up? No, of course not. Set in it effortlessly without thinking about it. Why? Yeah. Because you've been taught 
to believe your entire life that when you sit in a chair, it holds you up. Mm -hmm. If you were six years old and you sat in a chair in a group of your friends and people that you love and the the chair went out from underneath you and you fell and you were laughed at and you were humiliated, you just had a very traumatic moment. And yeah. now whenever you might step on stage or step in front of a large group of people, you check that chair a couple of different times mm-hmm. to make sure you don't experience that same moment. Why? Because that traumatic event is still governing your life. That pain is still governing your life. And until we can stop and ask, why do we do what we do? Why do we say what we say? Why do I believe what I believe? Wait, is this something that taught me to believe? Like, is this something that's true? Or did I learn this and it's a lie? Like we gotta get really honest with ourselves. Like a lot of us want change. A lot of us want to experience the life that we know is out there, but it requires us to open up closet doors that have some monsters in it that we've been running from our entire life. And you know, that secrecy, that 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 hiding it, and it comes that that's what that's where it thrives. Yeah. And it really comes down to this whole human connection thing. Yeah, uh, Tyler. It's like this idea, like what a culture, uh, what a culture values, we fear that we are not. Hmm. So whatever a culture values, we fear that we are not. So automatically, we tell ourselves based on how we grew up, we tell ourselves that if you really know me, if you got to know me, hmm. there's no way that you would accept me for who I am. Hmm. There is no way. So I'm gonna hide. I'm gonna hide my insecurities. I'm gonna hide my flaws. I'm gonna hide them behind my rage my control, my massive success, the money that I make, I'm just going to hide because I know if I show you my real colors, it's going to threaten the very thing I crave the most and that's human connection. But the problem with that is the real issue right there is that our, we are never going to belong in life, or let me say this, let me say it this way. We only belong to our level of self-acceptance. Hmm. Right, so the real issue, the real issue that's behind your control, behind your rage, behind your pursuit of excellence, your pursuit of growth, the real thing that's going on behind all that is you're trying to be good enough or you're trying to control the environment enough so that you are worthy of acceptance because this whole time you get to accept yourself. Like self, it goes back down to the root. It's love, man. Yeah. Love. It's self-acceptance. And that's what we're all looking for. Absolutely. And it's, and it's so liberating to be in that place and, and to be vulnerable. Like every, like every time, every time I've been able to open up and in different areas of my life, there's this, like this peace and this sense of freedom in it that you just want everybody to be able to experience, but it's, it takes courage to do so. And and that's the thing. It's, 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 it's super easy to, to just brush things under the rug yeah. And, and move on with life. And like you said, mask it with these other things like success and, and all this other stuff. That's the easy thing, but it's not sustainable long term. Uh, just like with anything else, like anything that that's worth doing um, takes massive effort and it takes strength. And, and I love, I love what you just said there. I, I listen. I heard this thing on a run yesterday it was Tom Bilyeu and he was talking about Michelangelo, I think. Mm-hmm. And he said, if, if people found out the hundreds of thousands of hours that went into me working on my craft, would they think less of the genius that I am? Like, yeah. would they like, th- like that, like takes it to like a whole another level. Like we're, we're sitting here talking about like, mm-hmm. if they knew about the pornography, if they knew about the alcoholism, if they knew about the drug addiction, if they knew mm-hmm. about the adultery, but he took that a step further and, and probably I'm assuming had gone through that and said, if they knew how much work it took me to get to be this good, would they yeah. still see me as this good? Yeah. <laughs> as though like there's some natural gift, like as though LeBron James is a better basketball player because he woke up one day and was, yeah. was who he was versus the thousands of hours in the gym uh, training. It's, it's such an interesting, such an interesting concept, man. Um, mm this has been an awesome conversation, man. I'd love to have, I'd love to have some further conversations with you for sure. But I think for our viewers, this is going to be an awesome, (laughs) awesome, uh, awesome awesome podcast. And we'll, we'll feature this on the vlog as well. So people can show that we did have a dress code uh, for today. (laughs) We're pretty much wearing the exact same thing, which is also awesome. 
Uh, but man, uh, where can people find you online? Where can they go to uh, why I stopped and, and all that good stuff? Yeah, so why I stopped is just why I stopped.com. Okay. You know, if anybody listening has their own why I stopped story, um, or if you want to know more information, you can just reach me through that website. You know what it reminded me of? Let me interrupt you there. It reminded me a lot of, are you familiar with I am second? Yeah, I, I mean, growing up in the Texas can handle. And yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, yeah, I can, I can remember, man, that I, I, there's been times I've spent hours at night watching all those videos, yeah. and it reminded me a lot, uh, a lot of that, which is awesome. Um, awesome. Where, where can everybody find you on that? Uh, yeah, so Instagram probably is the best place, so okay. just at Caleb, C-A-L-E-B underscore Campbell, a Campbell soup. Got it. Um, that's where I'm spending a lot more of my time as of late. Very good. Well, guys, with that, uh, this is the Breadwinner Podcast. Extremely glad to have had Caleb uh, here on this episode. I think that you guys will get a lot out of this. You probably need to play it again because there was some stuff in there, some tactical stuff there towards the end uh, that I'm going to listen back to, uh, and I know I'll get a lot from. Uh, but as always, I'm your host, Tyler Harris, and we'll see you next time on the Breadwinner Podcast. Bread. Bread. Bread.